My first point will be about the achievements of the school in our 13th year, and since we are here to celebrate, we should know what we are celebrating. Then I'll talk about the somewhat unusual position that the school is in of having a very close affiliation with two prime ministers. And then I'll have the great pleasure of introducing our guest of honor, ESM Go Chok Tong, uh, when he comes to speak here. So let me talk briefly about what our school has achieved uh, in the last 12 months or so in three areas. One, how we have enhanced our global standing. Two, how we have shared the Singapore experience globally and how we have continued to improve the school. And in terms of improving our global standing, this has actually been quite a remarkable year because just this year alone, we organized two major conferences. The first was the APSIA conference, which is the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs, which is probably uh, the most prestigious Association of Schools of International Affairs. And we also organized the world's largest uh, public policy conference with 1,300 participants from all over the world at our small Bukit Timah campus. And I emphasize our small Bukit Timah campus because the only practical problem we had was that we weren't sure whether there'd be enough toilets for 1,300 people. But the good news is that we had enough. <laughs> and the conference uh, went very well. We also, by the way, uh, continued uh, our partnership with the Nazarbayev University of Kazakhstan and signed a new five-year contract. In terms of our research uh, output, we had an outstanding year with 99 journal articles, 20 books, edited books, monographs, and 193 op-eds written by uh, our colleagues. And in the digital space, we also expanded our, in a sense, mind space dramatically and in, on Facebook, for example, we have over 400,000 fans, and that's more than NUS or NTU. And we are only a small school of 300 uh, students. Now, in terms of sharing the Singapore experience, there were two innovations this year, significant innovations. One, we launched a handbook of Singapore public policy innovations. We placed it on our website, and it's good. The good news is that the readership is soaring. It went up about 1,300% in the course of four weeks. Uh, shows, the, shows the interest that the world has in Singapore's public policies. And we also started a new course, the Lee Kuan Yew School course, uh, which is now a compulsory course for the students uh, at the Lee Kuan Yew School. Now, finally, also let me talk a bit about what our school has done in Number one, in terms of uh, applications for admissions to our school, we, we achieve a record number of 1,200 applications, the highest number we ever had. And this year, we also uh, welcome our first intake of MIA students. And we also had a wonderful 25th anniversary celebrations with our MPP. And last but not least, I want to mention that even in terms of our administration, I think we are now the first school to have achieved the Singapore quality class with People Niche this year. So on many fronts, uh, our school has a lot to celebrate. So all this brings me to my second point, which is also a point of celebration, which is that somewhat unusually for in Singapore's history, in our 52 years, uh, we've only had three prime ministers, uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, Mr. Go Chok Tong, and Mr. Lee Hsien Loong. Uh, in the same period, United States has had 10 presidents, Japan has had 24 prime ministers, Italy 23 prime ministers, even Malaysia had six prime ministers. And I, I say that because what makes our school rather unique as an institution in Singapore is that we are, of course, named after the first prime minister of Singapore, the founding prime minister of Singapore, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, and now we have the second uh, prime minister of Singapore, Mr. Go Chok Tong, as the chairman of our board uh, since 1st April this year. So a special round of applause and appreciation for Mr. Go Chok Tong for agreeing to do this. Uh, my next job is to briefly introduce Mr. Go Chok Tong because I think if I tried to tell his life story and his accomplishments, it might take me one hour, but I will just say a few brief things 
about some remarkable achievements in his 14 years as Prime Minister. And I can say this with some uh, confidence and conviction because I actually had the pleasure of working with him very closely when I was in the foreign ministry uh, in Singapore. So just to mention three areas of his achievements, uh, in foreign policy he had many achievements, but the two that stand out is the ASEAN Free Trade Area that was signed in 1992, and of course the brilliant Asia-Europe meeting initiative that Prime Minister Go uh, initiated himself uh, in the 1990s. But on the, on the domestic front, it's actually quite remarkable how many new programs were launched under his prime ministership. They included MediSafe, MediFund, EduSafe, Prime, Skills Redevelopment Program, Singapore Workforce Development Agency, and on the political front, GPCs, GRCs, nominated members of parliament, and of course the elected president, which as you know is also being refined right now. So there were a remarkable number of new initiatives uh, on the domestic front. But what is also equally remarkable about the prime ministership of Mr. Go Chok Tong is that he actually saw Singapore through several crises. And they were actually, I want to emphasize, a major crisis, including the 1997 uh, Asian financial crisis, the threats of terrorism we faced following the 9-11 attacks in New York. And as you know, we were supposed to be number two after New York. Then we had to go through the 2001 to 2003 economic recession and also the re incredible paralyzing SARS outbreak in 2003. So if there's one man in Singapore who knows how to handle crisis, it's ESM Go Chok Tong. So therefore, it's, it's, uh, it's truly wonderful for us that he's agreed to come here today uh, to share with us his reflections on governance, his reflections on where the school can go ahead. He will speak first for 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A session, which will be followed, of course, as part of the tradition of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Free Food. We will have a wonderful reception in the Wheat Yong Ham lobby. So with that, please join me in welcoming ESM Go Chok Tong to the stage. Well, I think welcome to the new students and uh, welcome to the alumni, and of course, the uh, other members here as well. Uh, in a way, this is also homecoming for me. Uh, many years ago, and looking around, I think that's before most of you were born, I was a student over here, so I'm quite familiar with the ground, except for this hall, which was not built at that point of time. So I'm happy to be talking to you about uh, the importance of uh, public policy. The government schools are gaining prestige around the world, Research and study of public policy have become more relevant and urgent in the face of pressing national, regional, and global challenges. Yet it is a fairly new field compared to the more established schools in business, medicine, law, and so on. So as marketable as MBAs and other degrees are, their graduates do not purport to solve society's problems. It remains a special purview and imperative of governments to lead the effect of powerful reforms through programs, legislation, and regulation, and unleash the full potential of societies for the common good. It is for the students of public policy to answer society's call of duty and to serve. So my question to you is, what is the value of a good and stable government. It cannot be measured like a company or a stock market. Yet we all know instinctively when there is a good government or when there isn't one. We can certainly see it in the faces of the people, the harmony and standard of living in the country. For Singapore, the government has been the architect for success and the foundation for nation building. From the day, or from day one, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and the founding fathers set out to build and strengthen national institutions like parliament, judiciary, and the civil service. They went to great lengths to recruit and groom the best of every cohort to lead the country. 
Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy was established to spread that philosophy to build the next generation of public leaders to serve the people and deliver positive change. That's why you are here. I have experienced a similar cause as yours. As a young civil servant, <coughs> welcome. That is our chief banker. <laughs> Sorry, excuse. Now, now you're rich. <laughs> oh, uh, I have experienced a similar cause as yours, but it's in development economics. As a young civil servant, I was sent to Williams College to do a master's in development economics. That was a special course for some 20 students in my, in my class from 16 countries, Asia, Africa, Central America, and Europe. So in return, I was able to put into practice what I learned on economics, because I was then working in the economic planning unit. But uh, years after I left uh, Williams, I always find it instructive to look back and track the progress of the 16 countries which were represented then as to how they had done. So using the framework of good, bad, and ugly from the uh, movie Start by Clint Eastwood, I would consider only four had made it to the good category. Six would be the ugly group. And amongst them are countries that have since broken up. So in Singapore's case, few gave us a chance when we became independent in 1965. So what was the secret of our improbable success? I want to focus on one important element, moral leadership. This is the most underrated aspect of successful societies and leadership. Winning elections and having the legal legitimacy to govern is not enough. You must have the moral authority to govern. Moral authority goes beyond personal property and character. It is a leader's value system for himself and his people. It is the basis for building trust in government that is often missing. Lee Kuan Yew, who gained independence to Singapore, established his moral authority to govern with a set of values to underpin, hold, and bind Singapore together. They include a fair and just society based on the rule of law, putting country before self, family, and clan, integrity and incorruptibility, Tolerance and multiracialism, family as a building block of society, hard work and frugality, meritocracy, that is equal opportunities and reward according to merit, compassion and helping hand for those lagging behind. These values are deeply embedded in the Singapore leadership. They are also entrenched in our society. Moral values are not just for political leaders and office holders. You need to give full meaning and perpetuate them as part of the national character. Here, the public service is key. Ministers will need to rely on competent and honest officials to help them formulate policies and, very importantly, to implement them. If you have a public service run by bad people, the latter will corrupt and undermine the system. Conversely, if you have good public officials supported by upright political leaders, they will find a way to reform a bad system. First, in Singapore, we have built up an ethical, efficient public service with values as its core, integrity, service, excellence. Our civil servants are paid a market competitive salary, but they do have an intrinsic desire to serve and to improve people's lives. How to attract, retain, and promote the right people? 
I hope you'll be curious to find out more during your time in the school because an outstanding ethical public service is the backbone of the Singapore story. We set up the school not just to honour Lee Kuan Yew on his 80th birthday, but also to share Singapore's developmental and public service experience with other countries. Since its inception, the school has grown significantly. Students come from all over the world. I'm told that we have students from 38 different countries currently enrolled in the school. We also have alumni taking on prominent and interesting roles in many different areas of work. Now, I was given a long list of uh, these alumni, but I'll just mention two. Aditi Prasad. Are you here somewhere? Aditi Prasad? Raise your hand if you are here. No? Well, never, nevertheless, I'll go on. Uh, she, an MPP 2011 graduate. She's the co-founder of Robotics LS, a company with a mission to inspire the next generation of innovators and creators. She helped lay the groundwork for Indian Girls Code, a free hands-on coding and robotics education program for underprivileged girls. The Indian Girls Code Initiative works to inspire and educate young girls to learn to code and develop real-world programs for real-world applications. Next, Will Chua. Also not here. Yeah, he's in Johor, but I was given a list of names of alumni who will be here. <laughs> Never mind. I've met him in Will Chua at the last uh, function. Uh, also an MPP 2011 graduate, who is now an entrepreneur. In 2014, he co-founded Follow Farm. Follow, F-O-L-O, is for Feed Our Loved Ones in Johor Bahru. Follow Farm is an urban farming community that aims to change the way we look at our waste in a way we grow our food. Follow Farm collects three tons of food waste per day from hotels and restaurants and turns it into nutrient-rich compost. They use a compost to organically grow vegetables for a community of almost 100 families. The school has done well. Much of this is due to the hard work put in by Dean Kishaw, his management, and staff. But we want to do better. How do we climb higher peaks? So let me share some ideas. I hope the faculty will study them with an open mind and take on board those who should help the school to do so. First, strengthen the link between theory and practice. Public policy theories are useful in developing and evaluating policies, and the school needs to continue to have rigorous teaching in this area. But it is good to go beyond theories. The school today has many good practice professors with deep experience in public service. You should find ways to better integrate the experience and lessons that these practice professors can impart within the academic lectures of our professors. Second, bring the Singapore insight home. If the art of government is an Olympic sport, we would have won more than one gold medal because we have innovated many groundbreaking political, social, and policy ideas. Foreign delegations come here all over to study the Singapore journey. At the LKY School of Public Policy, you have a front row seat to dissect, analyze, and contribute to the continuing work here. In this regard, the school has introduced the LKY School course this year to provide an overview of Singapore's policies. This module is compulsory for all. 
Besides rigorous teaching on the theoretical side, we can offer Singapore's experience through practice and adjunct professors. Beyond tapping on the experience of past officials, we can consider inviting serving civil servants whose knowledge is current to be practice fellows. This integration of theories and practice will set the school apart from other public policy schools. Third, I think the school has reached a comfortable size. It should now shift its focus to qualitative growth. In my view, the school is in a good position to examine how it can provide greater value add to policy making in Singapore. As our Minister for Law and Home Affairs, Mr. Shamugam, said in the speech last month, think tanks like the LKY School play a critical role in policy making by putting forward, quote, practical viewpoints that help the country. Unquote. We should take up this invitation. This does not mean that we should agree with the government all the time. In fact, I think it is more valuable when we can critically but constructively provide the government with alternative perspectives from research and analytical studies. Fourth, looking back to my experience at Williams College, I found it did not teach one fundamental lesson essential to nation building, that is, the importance of political leadership. Teaching this is not going to be easy, but the school should continue to emphasize the importance of a fair, competent, and honest leadership and an excellent ethical public service. As the governing board chairman, I look forward to working with the management team and faculty staff to build a better Dequanyu school for our students and for Singapore. For our discussion, I'll be happy to share with you my experience in formulating public policies and the trade-offs required. So thank you very much. So uh, ESM, you spoke quite a bit about leadership, eh? both at the beginning and at the end of your remarks. I wonder. You know, if you had to tell a story or two about one or two leaders that you met that either you enjoyed uh, working with or you were impressed by, who would you sort of mention as a sort of uh, leaders? Well, I think it's easier to mention some than to mention one. <laughs> uh, I made it a point to have, if I could, personal relationships with the leaders on the other side. And a couple of leaders uh, will come to my mind really. Uh, one is the uh, Canadian Prime Minister, John Christian, uh, because both of us were keen golfers, and each time we attended the uh, Commonwealth, his government meeting, we would enjoy each other's company, conversation, and of course, golf. The other uh, would be President Clinton. Uh, I met him uh, over golf. Uh, I wouldn't go into a long story, but actually the way I met him was this. Uh, before I met him, Singapore had the audacity to go against uh, President Clinton's uh, letter to the president, not to cane a white American boy called Michael Fay. Well, we had decided to cancel the boy. You know, We gave him six strokes at the rotan because the boy had vandalized the vehicles, buildings, and so on. How would you say no to the most powerful person on earth? Six strokes of the rotan. So don't, don't cane him. So cabinet thought it over. We said, well, how could we not cane him? Because Singaporeans would think, if you don't cane an American boy, how could you cane a Singaporean who would have more right than an American uh, foreigner? So we decided to reduce it from six strokes to four strokes. Of course, uh, commentators went to town. You know? <laughs> President Clinton's plea was worth only two strokes of the rotan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But that's not my story. My story was when I asked to visit President Clinton at the White House, my request, or rather my MFA's request, never went through to him. Never had a chance to meet him. Then I happened to meet another American whom I knew very well through playing golf. So when he came to Singapore, he asked me, 
He hasn't met President Clinton yet. That was probably after 12 to 18 months uh, after I became, or after he became president, or I became prime minister. So I said, no, I've not met, I've not met him yet. And I explained why I could not meet him. My request, I suspected, never went through to him. Of course, he was very annoyed. How could that be? This is between states. Just because you can't avoid it, did not mean he will not see you. Say, I'll do something about that. So I was wondering, how, what could he do? Say, don't worry. I am from Arkansas. I'm from Little Rock. Hmm. Bill Clinton was from Little Rock. So I know him. <laughs> so when I went to Vancouver for my uh, Commonwealth meeting, and John Cretion, the, the Canadian Prime Minister, was the host, lo and behold, I got the request that President Clinton has invited you to play golf. So I said, ah, that was his way of circumventing the White House aide who would block any request to see him. <laughs> So golf, I mean, that's not a meeting. So I play golf with him. And after that, of course, we play golf quite often. And the pinnacle of success in playing golf was when I played golf with him in Brunei at APEC meeting. After midnight, at 2 a.m. in the morning, I said, President, could I discuss the business matter? He said, yes. So how about doing an American Singapore FTA? Within 10, 20 minutes, both of us agreed, just do a US Singapore FTA. With President Donald Trump, you say, no, what is that? He did for me. See, but President Clinton's thinking was different. It's strategic. Do it with Singapore, we are anchored into ASEAN, into Southeast Asia. So uh, these are the two names, of course, yeah. if I have yeah. to mention my good friend John Major. But the most impressive meeting I had, not on the personal level, was with uh, Deng Xiaoping. A really very impressive man. But no, I won't take too long in answering all this. Yeah, I've answered you. a question, isn't it? <laughs> yes, you did. By the way, just a quick aside on uh, President Bill Clinton's golf. I happened to be the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs then. And after we had requested a meeting within you and Bill, President Bill Clinton, uh, uh, Ambassador Chan Eng Chi was an ambassador in Washington, called me. She said, hey, the Americans have insulted us. We asked for a meeting and they offered a golf game. <laughs> so I said, please accept. A golf game is four hours. A meeting is a half an hour. <laughs> I would have been furious because Kishore doesn't play good golf. <laughs> it's, it's a secret. And Chaninchi doesn't play golf. They do not understand the importance of golf. You see. <laughs> Okay, if anyway, we had a meeting. <laughs> yeah, we did. So, our first question now, Adam, Adam Nice. So, please introduce yourself and uh, ask the question. Thank you, Dean. Yeah, my name is Sun Shi. I'm a Chinese graduate yeah, of our school. Uh, good evening, ESM. Yeah, we, we are honored and very happy to have you serving as a chairman of our school. So, as a chairman, what, what's your vision for our school? And uh, what are your expectations? on our students, especially how should we balance principle and uh, pragmatism in practice? Yeah. yeah. Thank uh, you. I, as I mentioned just now, but I summarized it in, a, in, in another way, the school has done very well. But in my few months over here, I sense that uh, maybe we need you know, a little change here and there to take it to a new peak. And how do we do it? It is to offer more Singapore insights into the lecture. I asked Dean and I asked the management uh, committee staff, why do students come to Singapore? If it's the rigor of academic uh, teaching in public policy school, we can be one of the best, but it, could, it can go anywhere. They must come to Singapore for a special reason, and that's to understand the Singapore experience, the secret of Singapore's success. So how do we impart that? So, I'm trying to work on that because you have very good professors from outside Singapore who might not fully understand Singapore, but they are very good public policy professors. You need them. So the way to supplement will be through practice professors, adjunct professors. But that's not good enough. These are normally uh, top civil servants who are retired. So the new element will be uh, what I call practice fellows. Look for good civil servants at a very senior level who are still very current in their jobs. Get them to come and share what they are doing. Bring the lessons alive. They are dealing with real life issues today. So that's one way where I hope to impart a new 
level of uh, teaching and thinking into the school. Uh, other areas I have been discussing with the dean to see how we can, you know, add uh, maybe new content here and there, and uh, perhaps make it more uh, useful for the students. But I was interested, I mentioned the word value add. I found that as the government, I'm not getting my money's worth, not from the students, but from ideas from the school to the government. So that's why I made a point, find ways to do research, make constructive, critical perspectives, offer alternatives to the government. So if they could do uh, something and shake the government's thinking on some very basic policies, uh, then we get their value add. You see. So my thinking is a bit different. I want to get this flow back to the government. It's a good school. You must have very good opinions. You must be able to challenge the thinking of the government in some areas. But unfortunately, the dean you see is very sensitive, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Because I speak from personal experience. <laughs> no, because to be fair, no leader likes to be criticised. This is like a personal Donald Trump. I don't think he enjoyed being criticised, and neither do we, and neither do I. But do it constructively. You must build up that trust between one another. So for the students, in fact, you should tell us, what do you come here for? Which areas you want to know which are missing from the lectures in the school? Uh, then we know that not just you alone, but many students say, this is what I come here for, but somehow I don't get the satisfaction in the school. It's not in the syllabus. Then we can improve upon that. So that, that's my vision for the school. Uh. Dean Kishore thought, you know, we could do no more. He's done the best. That's it. <laughs> that's a peak. I don't believe him. <laughs> There's always another peak to crime. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> Uh, so we can teach one another, it's okay. <laughs> uh, so, Jack, and then I hope a student will come up also, a, a current student. We've had two, alumnus, two alumni now, maybe after that a student. Please, go ahead. I have a question. How do we bridge Li Kuan Yew School of Public Policy with the Civil Service College? Mm. I think the two should not be teaching differently. There must be a flow so that the civil service college... Uh, I'm, I'm saying this because I find that every time I give an idea to a politician, he will say, let me connect you with one of the directors. And then somehow the idea will disappear. So how do we capture, like you say, good ideas and not get it lost? The politician don't seem to have a problem, but when you go to the civil service, something gets lost. How do we solve this problem? Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that you have no problem with politicians. Jack Sim, <laughs> Jack Sim actually raised his idea with me about his World Toilet Organization. Huh. And my colleagues would say, why are you spending time on toilets with him? Huh. I said, no, I support him because it's a very important issue. I was thinking in terms of the cleanliness of our public toilets, in the coffee shops, uh, in the public places, I mean, they were terrible. So. so to have someone taking an interest in hygiene in the public toilets was very close to my heart, so I supported him. Then from there, he built up the idea, how about helping people in India and elsewhere? I said, good idea. He found that when he went to India, the people prefer to defecate outside in the field. That's organic uh, compost. <laughs> so, but it's a good effort. So your question is, civil servants. Well, first I think we should try and get the civil service, which is a very good one, to think beyond what they are doing. Uh, and you know, when they have new ideas, they must be prepared to consider and surface them out. So your specific question is, how do you connect Lee Kuan Yew School with the civil service college? There are links between them. But you know, Dean, you don't mind my saying so, I discovered that there was no bridge between them. <laughs> they, they have been interactions. Our people do lecture there. They do lecture over here. They do share case studies. Huh? So they are interlinkages, but in a very informal way. When I say no bridge, there's no formal uh, mechanism where we should share ideas on how we can do things together, better, and separately. So that is being done, and that will be done. But how to get civil service 
civil service to listen to you. That is another issue. <laughs> because you are not the only one. There are so many people with bright new ideas. And I can recognize some of the two here who also would have good ideas, but seldom listened to by the civil servants. I mean, you know, we've got to find a way to do that. Well, if you can't do it, go to a political leader who will listen with a good idea, like yours. So then we listen and we get things done. Okay, over there, please identify yourself. That's, that's you. Go ahead. I note that uh, Singapore has always been pragmatic. And I think that's embedded in the DNA of earlier leaders up to now as well. But I think pragmatic is a little bit like a skill. We have knowledge, skills, and maybe pragmatism is a bit more acumen part. What, do you, what is your take on how can we better train that and even our definition of pragmatism? Kishore, where is the aerial uh, shell? Oh, he's right here. He's right here. Right, right, right. Yeah. I just met him. He's from Israel. He has written you know, several books on Israel. He's come here to learn about Singapore. And your question was very relevant to our conversation before I came. Because he, he has met many people. And uh, the idea he got from them is Singapore is a pragmatic society. No ideology, no philosophy. He did not believe that. Because many elements of success. But there's a deeper philosophy in what we do. And uh, if you look at the whole thing, you discover that all the parts are linked to one another. Something happens here. You know, you, 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 you start to drink certain things. They're all held together. There is a deep philosophy. So he's going to uh, write a book on this Singapore philosophy or the Singapore secret. The net result of a half an hour's conversation was, I said, I'm available as a resource person for him. And he's coming back. And I'll give him time. So then he will answer your question. So read the book <laughs> when it comes out. OK. Thank you. Uh, James no, I'm trying to give more time to the others. Otherwise, you could go on and not, not, not fair to the others. Huh? Yeah. Thank you. James Crabtree is a former, a current Financial Times correspondent who's actually a faculty member at our school right mm. now. Uh, so, James, uh, and he's just finished writing a book on India. Mm. <laughs> that's, my, that, that's what my question's about. I, I was going to say that as the tallest member of faculty here, <laughs> uh, I'm delighted to welcome the tallest politician in Singapore to the <laughs> chairman of our board. Um, when, when you were Prime Minister, yes, Senghor, one of the, the defining characteristics of your premiership was the relationship you built between Singapore and India. You, you were known for developing a, a, a sort of look west policy towards South Asia. In all of the elements that you talked about, uh, you know, clean civil service, urbanization, there's all sorts of things that there's huge appetite in India to learn from the Singaporean example. And I wondered whether you had any particular ideas as to how the school could begin to capitalize on that, that demand from, from India. Well, I think uh, let's try and get more uh, officials of India to attend our school. This is public policy school at a, your public policy level, maybe at your public management level, and so on. Uh, then you can have interaction over there. We also have an in, uh, Institute for South Asian Studies. And we do get uh, professors from, uh, or former, or former uh, civil servants who are you know, professors over here. So those are ways where we can uh, impart you know, what we do. So primarily for the school, we've got to be targeted, get the Indian government to know that we have something to offer over here and get them to send their young officials who can become senior officials. If they can have a pipeline of these officials who can become later on top officials in India, then maybe there will be some impact of our thinking on the Indian the bureaucracy. Just scattered few people here and they won't make any difference in the big bureaucracy and the big population. Please, next, you can identify yourself for yeah. the ESA. Yeah, good evening, uh, Mr. Tong. Uh, I am Manu, and I'm a student at the MPA program. Uh, my question is regarding the statement of Dean Mabubani. He said that you were the crisis manager, Prime Minister of Singapore. So I would like to know which one of the crises you found the most challenging and how you went about resolving it. Well, first, uh, I would say it's not one person. It's a team and supported by a very... Uh, effective, uh, efficient civil service. Uh, the crisis which uh, Lin Kishore mentioned were different crises. One is the Asian financial crisis, easier to manage, it's just economic, just economic. And uh, of course, you know, Singapore was uh, in good state, we had good reserves, so it didn't affect us very much. The next one would be the uh, terrorists, 
uh, and SARS. So SARS would be the most difficult to handle because it was life and death matters and something which we could not understand. What was causing people to die just through contact? Is it airborne? Is it uh, through proximity and so on? So, so to get a better understanding itself uh, you know, was, was difficult. And then who would attend to uh, those uh, uh, afflicted by the uh, SARS? Because the doctors and nurses knew that close contact could mean death for you. And quite a few doctors and nurses died you see, in the initial uh, days. But very soon, the doctors and nurses uh, discovered what was the cause and how to take preventive measures. And it was through not breathing the viruses. Uh, so they covered themselves and so on. So that was frightening. At the same time, at the same time, you know, you have to show courage that life will go on as normal because you're losing tourists, business, hotel occupancy went down from 80-90% to 10-20%. So we got to you know, be seen and at the same time uh, demonstrate that uh, we, we take certain precautions. So my public functions went on as normal, but the, when the recipients of awards came up, they put up their hand to shake my hand, I told them this way. And I say, let's not shake hands, just take all pre preventive measures. In case I might have SARS virus, you shake my hand, then you breathe, and there you go. So, little gesture. Uh, so, that was the most uh, frightening of the uh, different crises. But the team was marvelous, the huh? team from the uh, uh, hospitals. The grassroots leaders, we have community grassroots leaders. They were so marvelous. They went out to distribute food to those uh, SARS patients who were quarantined at home. Went there, leave it on the outside the door, knock on the door, say food is over here, then they went away. You know, and then the, the, the victim would come and collect the food and so on. So it's a collective community effort. Okay, next. Yeah. Uh, good evening, uh, Minister Goh. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my name is Saravanan. I'm from Singapore, from MPP. Uh, my question was, race and ethnicity seems to be quite a big issue around Asia at the moment, but Singapore's success story seems to have come despite that. I wondered if you had any thoughts of why Singapore was so successful uh, despite that, and also if you had a political role model when you were a student in this school. Was I a political role model? No, no. If, you, if you had. No, who, would, who would have been your political role model? Oh, who would, I, who would have been my political role model? Yeah. 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 Swiss forward Lee Kuan Yew. Right. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, it was the... Uh, First PM and doing a very good job for us, so that would be my motto. You have to treat all races equally. That's straightforward. Nobody would dispute that. But in real life, the results of competition, meritocracy, may not end up with all races performing equally well. That's the problem. You see. So when one community doesn't do so well as the other one or two community, how then do you? uplift this community, the better they feel that they are part of us. The next is religion. Uh, you see, everybody must believe equally in a religion. As government, you can say so. On the ground, it's different. The Christians, in the early days, they would go and proselytize, to convert others to, uh, to, being, uh, to Christians. The Muslims protested. The Buddhists are you know, quite flexible. See? They won't mind. I listen to you, I may not believe you, provided you don't insult my religion. I'm prepared to give you a listening ear. Well, the Muslims are different. You don't try and convert them. So when they knew of the uproar you know, among certain people, we just told the Christians, why must you try and convert the Muslims? Try it on the Chinese and Indians, on the Hindus, that's all right. Because it's a political problem if you insist on doing it on, 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 on the the Muslims. In other words, you must be fair and just and yet be practical to know where are the problems. So I'll give you one example of uh, religious buildings. The Christians could pay a market land price to build their churches. The Chinese have no problems. The Buddhists, you know, Taoists, they could do so. But the Muslims, the Malays here would have a tremendous problem. Because also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in terms of income and wealth, they were also, the, uh, at the time, poorer community, no resources. But the mosques were very important, as they are today, for the Muslims. So as a government, you've got to make sure they have uh, places to go and worship. How do you do that? And yet, 
not attract unhappiness from uh, the other religious groups? Well, we found a solution. First, in every uh, estate, so many Muslims, there should be one mosque there. We reserve the site for them. Normally, under our system, you must tender for a piece of land, and the highest bidder will get it. The Muslims will have no chance if you go on a tender basis. They haven't got the money. So we reserve the site for them so that uh, they do not have to tender. But they have to pay market price so that uh, the other groups do not be too unhappy. At least it's market price. It was reserved for them. But where do they get the money? Well, we facilitated them through the uh, pay mechanism. Every Muslim, and we pass a law on this, we have to contribute. At that time, 50 cents to start with, to a mosque building fund. The Muslims are very happy because they are Muslims, they know, they got to contribute. And the Chinese, the Christians, the Hindus were happy because you are not using government money to build mosques. So, so you've got to balance the interests of various groups and they'll be seen to be fair. Have we used our budget to pay for mosques? I think the Chinese, the Indians, the Christians, they have a right to object. How can you use my taxes to pay for the mosque? As a principle, you'd be wrong. But this is the money. We only facilitate using the mechanism of uh, you know, pay and so on to, to collect money to, to build a mosque. So that's how we, we you know, do this. And the ethnic uh, quota policy, we do not allow our public housing uh, to be enclaves of Chinese, Indians, and Malays. So in every housing estate, in every block, you have a multiracial population. Walk along any corridor, you'll find that you have a Christian, a Hindu, a Catholic, a uh, you know, Muslim staying together, same floor. Of course, occasionally there will be neighborly dispute, but uh, by and large, you know, every block is multiracial. So this is a policy. Is it pragmatic to answer the other question just now, or is it philosophical? Something deeper, I see, that, that we are trying to do. You try this in other countries, force them to stay together, I think the government will be out, or there will be riots and so on. <laughs> we have succeeded. Because we started very early from day one. You see. Everybody is equal, and yet you know the differences, and you try and make them equal in result where we can, on a fair and just uh, principle basis. Okay, Professor Wu Ming Kung, from a faculty member. Just a minute, you know, I mean, you are not going to ask the question, I may not answer it. That is why we have a reserved uh, election for president, reserved election for the minority community. This is part of our multiracialism uh, policy. But uh, there was a seminar on this. Huh? Yeah, actually, I just came from uh, uh, chairing a discussion with uh, Minister Shanmugam, uh, organized by IPS, on the new provision for reserve election. And I, Minister Shanmugam actually spent 45 minutes explaining very well. But he also went in, like, like you, he went into this history and he explained how Singapore's multiracial harmony is a result of mm. decades of intervention. You, he, he cited some of the policies that you cited here, like housing and so on and mm. so forth. So, uh, so the reserve election is another piece of intervention on the part of the government to and continue to enhance multiracial harmony. So read about it tomorrow. <laughs> yes, I think I'm quite serious for the Singaporeans over here to understand why we do this, which is quite unpopular with a, a large proportion of the population because it goes against the principle of meritocracy. See, so it's multiracialism, meritocratic. Why, why do you force us to choose somebody from a minority community? So read the explanation tomorrow. Yeah. I actually uh, study economic growth and development in uh, Asia. And in my observation, uh, Singapore has been so successful in the past 50 years because it's outperformed the neighboring country, much better than other country. But I do believe that in the next 50 years, Singapore will be even better by helping and making the neighboring country doing to do much better than before. Um, so it means the contribution of Singapore can help Singapore a lot and also help Asia a lot uh, in the next 50 years. So somehow, it's a critical uh, conviction. Um, I, I, I do believe Singapore should take it. And in my observation, actually, uh, 
Singapore success actually depend on three S factor. You know, Singapore, I think three S uh, uh, was here. The first one, strategy. They are very good with strategy in terms of you know, strategy uh, establishing very wise um, uh, strategic positioning uh, dealing with complexity and on the way uh, um, stand out at a somehow very uh, admirable um, uh, nation. The second one, sustainability. We are coming from outside. We're surprised, you know, here people with different religion can work together so closely, friendly, productively, amazing. And sustainability in terms of, you know, uh, excellent urban planning, environmental uh, protection, mm. and also actually a uh, very good foundation with educational system. That's a certain. But I, the third thing uh, I think quite important, just surprising. Always surprise the people and uh, the neighboring country, the world, with some initiative we never imagined before. Now, I would like to test your reaction um, about my proposal here mm. for Singapore, because Singapore actually have national service for the men two years, because you know, ASEAN now um, actually have established their ASEAN economic community, and we need a lot more connectivity, interaction, and innovation. So can you send your men for six months, have to go to 10 ASEAN countries to do whatever you want, but receive low pay, and you appreciate what you have enjoyed in Singapore, but you can also have policymakers there, people there to do better, whatever we do. So six months come back and, you know, 12 months left or, or 18 months left serve in the army. But in that way, you can strengthen Singapore a lot and strength to actually help 10 ASEAN countries from, you know, Myanmar to Vietnam, Indonesia. Because I just back here in Indonesia and I think Singapore can play a lot of role in helping, you know, other countries, uh, you know, upgrade their strategy, coordination, and uh, collaboration. So um, I, I just want to get your reaction on uh, this kind of, you know, yeah. national service for the men, even women in the future for Singapore. Okay. We will help other countries. Because unless our neighbors prosper, Singapore cannot prosper. Unless the world grows, Singapore cannot grow because we are dependent on trade and investments. So we will help other countries. But your suggestion is actually a non-starter. You try and convince parents to send their sons to spend six months out of Singapore to help others. They say, this, how does that help Singapore? It, development, they understand, but national service is to defend Singapore, security of Singapore. So parents are, not, are going to object. I don't mind they're doing two years, two and a half years to defend Singapore, but to help others, please, I'm not going to allow it. You see. So you can clear the parents. You can clear the, 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 the boys uh, uh, to, to agree. You see. And secondly, let's say that uh, our national servicemen had done one and a half years national service. The last six months were sent to neighboring countries. You think they would not be suspicious? <laughs> <laughs> Your national service understands our ground very well. You know, they are everywhere, you see. <laughs> they you. will never agree. You Thank you. Yeah. They will never agree, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Next, next uh, question, please. Identify yourself. To the so, you said Singapore... From? Uh, from? Oh, Philippine. sorry. From Indonesia. Indonesia. Yeah. Ah, uh, you said Singapore is the an anchor of Southeast Asia. And do you think uh, with the emergence of neighboring countries like Indonesia and Thailand, Singapore has what it takes uh, to maintain this position? Did I use the word anchor of uh, Southeast Asia? I don't think so. No? Did I? Did? No, I don't think so. Because anchor doesn't move, you know? <laughs> I think but, uh, I, I, I had used the term catalyst. Okay. See, we would like to be the catalyst in ASEAN. That means of ideas, of programs, innovation. Then we catalyze change over here. Uh, that's what you, we want to do. So your question is, can we continue to play this role? Answer is yes. See. We must try and play this role. To benefit the others, which benefit us. Well, Singapore suggested when I was Prime Minister that we have an ASEAN economic community. And of course, I was able to persuade them, the, the other leaders, to understand this is not for Singapore alone, although we would benefit from an economic community. It's for all of us. So the ideas got through. So for the next stage, what can we do? I think uh, there's a new idea which I've been thinking about you know, and selling them to the government in Singapore, and that's to have smart ASEAN. Digital ASEAN. Now, if you can find ways to help our neighboring countries, to
to go digital and ways to connect our various economies. And we are considered as one uh, intelligent or digitally connected economy. Our startups, entrepreneurs, innovators can compete against China. China, they have Alibaba, Tencent, and so on, because they got a market. And these uh, enterprises could make profits through very small margin. Philippines, how many people? 80 million. Singapore, 6 million. Indonesia, because 250 million by itself is not big enough. So if you can have this concept of a linked, smart ASEAN, we go digital, our entrepreneurs can, uh, I think, go uh, compete against China. So what can Singapore do? We can be a catalyst. I'm not thinking of Singapore being the base for all these startups. We can have multi-super corridor. Yeah, they call it multi-super uh, corridor for, for internet in Malaysia. Look for Indonesia. Which part of Indonesia? Maybe Jakarta, maybe some other parts, Thailand. Link up all this. Then we have our own ASEAN Silicon Valley. I think it can okay. be done, but it should be a vision. Then young people say, ah, there's something I can look, up, look, look, look forward to. So Singapore can therefore play a role of being a catalyst. We've got the resources, we can help uh, Indonesia to build up their digital uh, capabilities if necessary. But anchor, no anchor, you don't move anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, okay. I think President uh, Clinton said that. President Clinton? Uh, you, you mentioned President Clinton said uh, he came to Singapore because it's an anchor of uh, Southeast Asia. They must have said it. <laughs> no, never mind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, it's okay. I mean, some, some people do use anchor, but we yeah. never, because, you know, let's say Singapore is the anchor, right? Indonesia decides to sail away. This anchor is of no use. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Too big a super tanker, too small an anchor. <laughs> Indonesia can be the anchor of Southeast Asia, and it must be the anchor, stability for the whole region. That I'm prepared to use. Yeah. Big country, you provide that ballast, that anchor you know, for Southeast Asia. So tell yeah. President Jokowi, <laughs> be the anchor for Southeast Asia. Gentleman up there, then the lady, please. Introduce yourself, please. Good evening. My name is Iwi. I'm a second year MPP student. My question is... From? It's cool. MPP or you know, MPP from, from Singapore, from... Oh, right. I'm a Singaporean. That's right. I and wanted him to know. <laughs> I'm surprised Dean could not recognize the accent. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm a true blue Singaporean. No, you thought you were from China. Yeah, but this, this is the global audience here. <laughs> no, my point is you did not recognize his accent. Is it? How Singaporean are you if you could not recognize it? <laughs> my question is related to the sustainability of okay. Singapore. It's about filling Singapore with more children. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have many policies to encourage uh, more, more, uh, the birth of more babies in children, and one of which is flexible work arrangements to encourage the private sector uh, to, to have flexible work arrangements so parents can have the peace of mind to, to uh, go into parenthood. A common sentiment that I hear from many of my friends working in the private sector is that working hours are too long, so much so that they are just pushing their marriage and parenthood plans uh, 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 you know, further behind, delaying, and that it's going to be very difficult to balance having children with work commitments, particularly in the private sector. How can we make flexible work arrangement more attractive to the private sector because there seems to be a common sense of cynicism. They don't feel employers have really bought into flexible work arrangements. So how can we make flexible work arrangement more attractive for the private sector and you know, to contribute to the sustainability of our population? I, I will not answer the question on how to make it more flexible, but I can... Uh discuss Attractive. whether making it flexible itself will produce children. I'm not sure, because we are a very urbanized uh, place and people now have many interests, you know, many challenges for their lives. And I do not understand, you know, you are the maybe millennial generation or younger. The motivations are very different. The life for you is so exciting and you've got the resources, you can do so many things. First, people are getting married later because they can enjoy so much life. And they don't need to work to support themselves. People like us, the day we graduated, we go for the first job they came along, right? And our ambition was to get married quickly, have children. But thinking is very different now. 
have children as late as possible, marry as late as possible, generally speaking. So flexible working hours, you allow them, doesn't mean they spend time. They will spend time traveling, or they spend time doing things, you know, and so on. We, we do have flexible uh, arrangements in many places. You can come anytime you like, go back anytime you like from home. So we haven't found a way, despite all the measures that we have taken, to get people to be able to have more children. We haven't found a way. So we study countries like Finland, Sweden, France, and so on. Some of the countries have done better you know, uh, with some policies. So you've got to study those policies and find out what your work. So your, idea, your, your concern is a very good, serious concern. Uh, your suggestion can be looked into, and it should be, should be looked into, but I'm not sure by itself it can change. It's the, it's the change of the whole environment and thinking of a younger generation. What do younger generation uh, want to do? Uh, but it's for you to tell them, if we don't produce ourselves, reproduce ourselves, uh, sooner or later, there'll be fewer and fewer Singaporeans. And uh, it's a joke, but maybe it may come true. The Singaporean population now forms, I think, if I'm right, about 60% of the population and if we don't reproduce ourselves, we build up all these resources, we have new Singaporeans taking over Singapore because the proportion will go up and you want them. You give them PR, you make them new citizens. Then the original natives will be smaller and smaller in proportion. So if you, are, you don't like the idea, better go and have more children. Are you married? I'm, I'm single, yeah. <laughs> how, how old are you? 28. 28. When, by what age do you think you'll be married? No, serious in, questions. Yeah, in all seriousness, actually, I would like to settle down by 30 years old. Okay, by 30, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I'm working hard, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Has she said no, yes? No, you're working, <laughs> you're working hard to get married or working hard in the office? <laughs> dating, yeah. Huh? <laughs> dating. <laughs> what is it? He's working? dating, he's dating. Oh, but you're working hard in the office. <laughs> I'm working. asking. Oh, so no, if you're no. working hard in the office, take flexible time off. <laughs> ah. If you take time off, your productivity is lower. Are you prepared to sacrifice one promotion to get married? No, I mean, this is a serious balance, you know? Because mm -hmm. you say, no, no. You look at lawyers, for example. Lawyers, they've got a choice. If you work very hard, you become a partner sooner. You say, no, I just work as a legal assistant. Five to six. Pay me what my productivity is worth five to six o'clock. I want to get married. That's attitude, but people don't want to do it. I've got the capability, I can do more, why should I? And then they'll work, they'll work you know, long hours. But it's a choice. It's a choice by ourselves, but we all choose to work very hard. It's a culture, you see. Mm -hmm. So, 30, yeah? Which year, are you, which year are you in now? 28, you know. No, no, I'm in uh, you know, school. School. I'm, I'm in my second year. So final year. Final okay, year. so you come and celebrate with us, alumni, you know, your wedding ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> we, by the way, we are all invited. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, and then you have your first child. If I'm the chairman, I'll make sure you get a bonus from us. Only <laughs> <laughs> Kwan School bonus. <laughs> Okay, good luck to you. <laughs> <laughs> and now, appropriately, we have two ladies. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. But well, it's a serious question which you asked. No, no, no easy answer. Thank, thank you. you for thank your time. you. I'm an MPA student from China, and my name is Fia Qing. And uh, I, I still remember during the orientation week, uh, the dean's lecture, I asked you a question. It's like, uh, what do you think the, the, uh, the most difficult that like China is facing, facing both democratically and both international one? And I still remember the answer. You, you told me, uh, uh, China need to, yeah, I, I need to go, go to my note. <laughs> Yeah. Wait, you're, you're quoting me or you're quoting me? No, 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 no. The, the, because this question is from the answer from the dean. Oh, from the dean, okay. okay. The, then yeah. you answer uh, the question. No, 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 no,
the question I want to ask is from the answer of the dean. It's ah. like from that answer. Okay, from I, the answer ah, I get the trouble. He will say he doesn't agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, listen, listen, sorry, listen, sorry, put you listen. in such a position. No, no, listen, listen. Okay. Yeah, the answer the dean gave to me is like first domestically, uh, China uh, need to the pro political system need to adjust a rise, rising middle class, and uh, the international uh, 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 problem that we are facing is like to prevent. You know uh, the neighbors around China see 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 we like as a as a threat. So my question is from from the the international one. So so how do you think what China should do to prevent the you know the neighbor countries see us as a, really as a threat? And you know, uh, 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 China now the 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 foreign policy is we see like more confident. And what's your opinion about this? Well. Um, <laughs> No, my, my opinion is, to speak frankly, as China grows, it's going to be more assertive, even though it is trying to restrain itself. Just through its sheer size, it's going to crowd out space for the neighbors, whether it's in uh, IT or whether it's in manufacturing. You know, whatever you do, you can do as well and very often better. So that means you're crowding out the space of other people. Uh, Hong Kong is an example. Hong Kong used to be the port for China. Very important port, the first, uh, the largest in the world in terms of container shipment. Today, Hong Kong is relatively a smaller port because the Chinese ports have grown and uh, because of the manufacturers from China. And you could do direct shipping from the ports in Shanghai, Shenzhen to Europe without going through uh, Hong Kong. So my point here is, as China grows, it's going to you know, elbow space bigger and bigger and others to be crowded out. So what should we do? I say, China, you're growing. Please do not show your muscularity so quickly. There are others around you. So when you are trying to be too muscular in advancing your policies, you are going to you know, make the others a bit cautious of you. Right? OK, thank you for your answer. Are you, going to, are you going to convey this to the Minister for Foreign Affairs? No, 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 no. <laughs> we have other students from the Foreign Affairs you know, <laughs> Minister. Uh, no, I can understand why China is doing the way it is doing. But as neighbors to say, you, know, you, are being, you are being too muscular in your approach. And that's quite sincere. I'm not in government now. I can say it a bit more frankly. The Minister for Foreign Affairs won't say this the way I said it. <laughs> Okay, thank, thank, you, thank you, thank you, thank you for your answer. But because this is quite an honor that we can ask questions. Yes, There's a little bit, you know, another question. You are obviously a very successful person, and I just wondering, like, what's your most, you know, successful experience that you think in your life? You are <laughs> wrong. You know, that I am being the most successful person. When I graduated, I applied for the research fellowship. I wanted to do my masters and later on my PhD and be a professor. I never became a professor. <laughs> so I, I, I failed there to realize my dream. So success is, it depends on how you define it. You know, it, it advancing your childhood dream, which I, you know, I could not get. And then when I was in shipping, I became the managing director. I was sailing quite comfortably, living a nice lifestyle. I never, I never uh, was able to hold on to that job. I became a politician. So am I successful? Or have I failed to achieve something which I love to do? Shipping was and still is very exciting. I could not do that. So you think I'm successful? <laughs> do I look happy? <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. Okay. thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm running out of time. Can I take the two questions together, if you don't mind? All right. Yes, please. Because it's about three minutes away. So if you don't mind. Two questions. Identify yourself and please go ahead. 我叫江俊文, 从这个问题来想到这个知与行的关系问题
呃呃，知难行易还是知易行难？就是以你的那个几十年的经验，呃，你是怎样看待的？还有就是你是呃怎么处理知易行的关系的？呃，另外呢，就是我们理工院学院在呃加强理论与实践结合这个问题上，有没有系统的呃构想，占这个呃系统的计划构想 ？I shall ask Dean to interpret it. <laughs> no, that is the, the dean is arranged for a translation. You, you told me you, there have been interpretation, so yeah, yeah, that's interpretation. So, who's, so? who's doing the interpretation? Okay. Um, yeah, good afternoon, um, Dean and uh, Mr. Go. Um, I indeed feel very honored to have the chance to ask the opportunity uh, to ask the questions. I'm from uh, Chengdu, China. Um, I have these questions uh, earlier on. You mentioned that it's very important to uh, link the theory together with the practice. And um, in China, we have a well known educator, Tao Xingzhi, also um, adv um, advocate the same thing. So I would like to understand, based on your personal experience, uh, you think it's easier to practice, um, to, to learn theory or is uh, uh, rather which one is more difficult to understand to acquire the knowledge or to actually practice what we have learned that's my first question and second question how do you actually balance the two oh, I think it's easier to learn theories that's what you go to uh, university for and we learn all the theories but to put them into practice is not so easy uh, leaving aside public policy they said the theory we should learn in school business school or about marketing that you must innovate you must you know, destroy before you can reconstruct. The theories are right, but how do you do it? So my own view is implementation, the practice part is much more difficult. So how do you balance the two? And this is what uh, uh, we should try and do. The theories are important, it must be rigorous. Because you must understand the philosophy behind certain things. Theories are based on past practices, which then became theories and principles uh, through you know, deep studies by others. To understand that, then you've got to extract elements from the theories to put them into practice. And in practice, well, the school will try, I think, to get people who are practicing it to uh, explain how they practice it. And I hope in the school, the professors will say the theory is this. You practice in a certain way, not quite in accordance with theories. Then you try and balance the two. But at the end of the day, implementation is most important. Good ideas which are poorly implemented will become bad ideas in the eyes of the uh, people. So you've got to focus on implementation, which means uh, practice, be practical about your theories. Wait for the translation. Uh, no, she, she, no, she heard it. It's, she, has, she has heard it already. Oh, she has, heard, it, yes. she has uh, heard the you translation you already. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Next que last question. Have you passed the time, but we'll take one last question. Yes, please. Um, so my question is based on the fact that um, given our today's climate where we do face a lot of uncertainties as well as um, the talk about how young people are a strawberry or avocado generation. Yeah. So what are the kinds of potential crises that Singapore will face in the future as well as uh, the kinds of advice that you'll give to us uh, in preparing ourselves for these crises? Well, let me try and scare you first. <laughs> Terrorism is closer than you think. ISIS is already in Marawi. And I think ISIS probably may have a chance to establish itself in uh, the Rakhine State in Myanmar. And today, you know, we just announced, arrested uh, two uh, local population as potential you know, uh, threats to, to us. Uh, one man is well educated, he's the managing director of a logistic company, wanted uh, to go to Syria to fight those who were against the Muslims there. And uh, if they see Singaporeans over there, you know, because we do have people there to help uh, the you know, people going against the ISIS, they say they will kill Singaporeans. So in our midst, we do have such people. And they are self-radicalized. The lady, one woman, just went online you know, and wanted uh, to go and join them. But luckily, she didn't go too far. and She was nabbed. They were trying to rehabilitate her. So they are already in Singapore. Those whom we have arrested, a handful. But how many out there whom we do not know? Maybe they are not there yet, potentially we don't know. But the threat, Mar Marawi, then Sulawesi, where years ago the Muslims and Christians were killing off one another, and I think they were trying to create a ground for that. So that is a big challenge for us. And uh, the 
government is already passing that message, more or less trying to condition all of us. It's not a question of when, you know, it's not a question of if a bomb or a truck will be driven into some crowded place, places in Singapore. It's a question of when. So mentally, they are prepared to react. So when this happens, they will know how to react. And the big worry for us in reaction is a bit like uh, other crises have handled. It's not the bomb per se, or the casualties, or the fatalities per se. It is the aftermath. What would that mean for race relations? That's number one. If as a result of that, race relations become fragile, broken, collapsed, then you know, the terrorists would have achieved its purpose. We would have been much worse off. So that's one challenge. Huh? And that's a, a life challenge which uh, the uh, security agencies are every day worrying about this. Then the uh, other challenge will be how to sustain a high economic growth for Singapore. That will grow 2-3%, I think we can do it. But politically, would people like you accept 2-3% growth in your wages? Uh, that's a big political question. My time growth was 8-9% because we had so much s s slack in the, s in the economy. Land there, labour was very cheap, uh, benign the external environment, 8-9%. We're all very happy. A new generation, 2-3% growth. Seeing that your parents have enjoyed such good growth in the past, you are going to be very unhappy. So can we change your mindset? This is the new growth. Be very happy. Your, your, your foundation is that high. The foundation for your parents there, foundation for my parents down here. See, but people compare. See, my father you know, was a taxi driver. He could own a five-room flat. I'm now an engineer. I could only buy the four-room flat. I'm worse off. Quite right. Compared to your father, you're worse off in terms of achievements. But that's a reality. So it's not a growth that we cannot sustain. It's how to get Singaporeans to accept politically that from now on, you know, 2 3% growth in their income is considered very good because your starting base is so high. If we can't convince you on that, well, there'll be a change in government and people think life will get better. I can tell you life will get worse very quickly because that new government still will not be able to produce you 5 6% growth. But young people don't understand. They say things just work. And that's the big problem with many people. Singapore works because there are people in the government, in the civil service, that make it work. And the private sector too, there are people there that make things work. So you say, no, no, anybody can work in Singapore. I've heard this many times. What's so difficult about your job? Anybody can do it. What's so difficult being a minister? Anybody can do it. But if you, you know, ask questions, which my friend from Israel has been asking, what is the secret that everything works? Not just things are working, therefore we can take liberty. You see. Uh, that's a challenge politically. How to convince people don't take liberty with Singapore. We are too small, things work, don't take liberty. That's a big political, political challenge, which the new government has got to put across to the people. So there are other uh, challenges, but I think, Dean, you're looking at the time. Huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, me, I, I, like to, I like to ask Dean a question. What to you is the biggest challenge for Singapore going forward? which I have not answered in all the questions. <laughs> Gosh, this is like an exam uh, test. I'm the governing board chairman, you're okay, the dean, I, you know. I know, I know, I know, I know. If I don't okay, let me, you, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me give a very quick uh, answer, and it's actually similar to the answer I gave about China, which is that we have created one of the most successful middle-class societies in Singapore with uh, probably one of the best uh, education systems uh, with a very globalized population with uh, globalized expectations. And so the political culture of Singapore has got to change and adapt, I think, uh, to this new environment also. And I think I see that as the okay, elaborate, biggest you know, challenge. Because your un my understanding of political culture may be different. What do you mean my political culture has got to change? <laughs> I mean, are you, are you saying the <laughs> Prime Minister and Ministers must change attitude towards people like you? 
you must explain. No, no, I, 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 but I, but I do. It's not, it's not. I'm not making a personal statement here. <laughs> but more uh, as a sort of, uh, in a sense, the going back to the Ari Chavez question about the philosophy of governing Singapore, uh -huh. and I think the philosophy of governing Singapore that worked very well in the first 50 years did not necessarily work well in the next 50 years. So that I think that's a, and, I, and, I, and in many ways we are changing. We are clearly okay. Singapore is becoming more open in many ways. But I think that that process of continuous change is what I see as the biggest challenge. But okay. this is no, an I, unexpected I, I, question. I, I, I agree. Unexpected I agree. Answer. But what is this new political philosophy and change you are looking after? It's a very important thing. We've got to change, but as I said, theory is got to change, but practice is change to what? Yeah. You are the dean, you know. You better give us <laughs> The whole, I think, the, the, whole public school, the whole school of public policy is a stage resting on your shoulders. Well, I think that, if you need more time to answer that, we can give you more time. Okay. No, no, I, I, actually, this is part of the continuing discussions we are actually having right. uh, with the students. But let me let, let's say this has been this has been truly, as you can agree, uh, fascinating. And you know, I let me answer the question that ESM go asked about himself. But he said, "Am I successful?" So I think you know one of the most difficult jobs in the world is to succeed a great leader. And it is a fact that Singapore's first Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, was a great leader. And frankly, if you are asked to succeed him, it's one of the world's most impossible jobs, and most people fail. Very few people succeed after a great man. One of the few persons I know who successfully stepped into the shoes of a great man and then did a brilliant job as a Prime Minister is Mr. ESM. So please join me in thanking him and congratulating him. Thank you. But I want to have the last word in case, no, in case you are misled by him. I have succeeded because a great man wanted me to succeed. That's key. If Lee Kuan Yew said you take over and you know, he didn't bother whether I succeeded or not, it would be very, very difficult. So the great man understood how Singapore should move on. It must have this pipeline of leaders with values uh, to you know, uh, look after Singapore. So he wanted me to succeed and he helped me to succeed. So don't say I've succeeded just because I was a very able man. No, no. <laughs> it's a teamwork. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And that's the formula of success. <laughs>